Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We're talking about Jesus as the Son of God. The title of this series is Knowing the Son and I really pray that you are getting to know the Son of God as never before. We've been looking at how unique Jesus really is. We've seen his unique being, he is God manifested in the flesh. We've seen his unique life. He was the one who came, born of a virgin, demonstrated to be the Son of God by the signs and wonders and miracles that he did, and also demonstrated to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he died in faith and expectancy that God would raise him from the dead. Now in this session, we're going to talk more about the unique mission of Jesus. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent his son. He sent his son into this world to perform a unique mission. We know that Jesus came to proclaim the kingdom of God, but even more than that, the kingdom of God was revealed in Jesus himself. Who he was demonstrated the nature of the kingdom. We can put it this way, because Jesus is the king, wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom is found. And so we also see that this kingdom that Jesus came to bring was the kingdom of God's love. And Jesus, as the love gift of the Father into this world, came to fulfill the mission of the Father. And I believe that this is the essence of sonship. When we say that Jesus is the Son of God, we're not talking about some physical relationship or some natural relationship in the way that fathers have sons in the natural world. We're talking about an eternal relationship which is best described as father and son. And this means that the father gives the initiative and the son responds to the father's will. Jesus said, I've come to do the will of him who sent me. And so when we trace the mission of Jesus, we discover his uniqueness as the Son of God. The term Son of God confuses some people and really the answer, the way of getting rid of this confusion is to understand it is a relationship that exists between two persons of the Trinity. There is only one God, but that one God has revealed himself to be Father, Son and Spirit. So today we're going to talk more about the mission of the Son of God. Hello and welcome to this session in the Sword of the Spirit series, Knowing the Son. We've been looking at the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Lord, our Savior. We've been looking at him in all his glorious titles and his wonderful being. In the last sessions, we've been looking how unique he is, the unique being of Jesus Christ. And his uniqueness is uniquely reflected in each of the Gospels. Matthew presents him as the great king. Mark presents him as the servant. Luke presents him as the perfect man. John presents him as the Son of God. Then we've been looking at some events in the life of Jesus which show that he has a unique life. We saw his unique birth in the virgin birth. We see his resurrection, which is absolutely unique, and the ascension of Jesus Christ, which is unique. I want to say one or two more things about the virgin birth because I had to skip over it really a little bit when I was teaching on it. And uh, I've been thinking more about the purpose of the virgin birth. And while I was very clear on the fact that uh, I'm not sure about the biological reasons for this, I'm not qualified to talk about it, but there may be a very significant theological reason why Jesus was born of a virgin. Um, because sin, theologically, is passed down uh, through the, the human seed. Uh, and uh, because it's passed down through the seed, Adam sinned and his 
sin was passed down through all humanity, through his seed, but now a second Adam has come, a second Adam and a last Adam, who is free from Adam's sin. And so then Christ becomes the new seed for, new, for the new humanity. And so there may be, therefore, quite a strong theological reason why Jesus was born of a, of a virgin. Also, it's wonderful to think, too, that Mary's womb had been totally reserved and consecrated for the Son of God. It had to be used, first of all, for its holy, consecrated service to the Son of God. So that she was a virgin was entirely appropriate, and some would say necessary then, for, uh, for Jesus to have been born of a virgin. And perhaps also it was necessary that Jesus to, for Jesus to be born of a virgin to show that his real father was God and not any man. And then this would surely demonstrate the uniqueness of Jesus Christ as a human being. Well, there's a few more thoughts on the virgin birth, but whether we talk about the virgin birth or the resurrection or the ascension or indeed any other aspect of the life of Jesus, we find that it is absolutely unique. Now, we're going to carry on in the same theme of the uniqueness of Jesus. This time, we're going to look at his mission. And we see something of the uniqueness of his mission in almost every single one of these Sword of the Spirit series. In effective prayer, we consider the prayer life of Jesus, which was unique. In knowing the Spirit, we see how he depended entirely on the Holy Spirit for guidance, for the power of the Holy Spirit in his life and ministry. In the rule of God, we see his teaching about the kingdom of God. In living faith, we look to his faith and consider the way in which he used God's word. In ministry in the spirit, we see the way Jesus counseled people, cast out demons and healed the sick, how he spoke with prophetic authority. In knowing the Father, we see the mission of Jesus uh, in relation to his triune relationships within God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And his ministerial partnership with God the Father. In listening to God, we see how the Son discerned what to say and do throughout his earthly mission. In reaching the lost, we consider the ministry of Jesus in evangelism and see how he announced God's news with words and deeds and, and the perfect life of his ministry. Then in salvation by grace, we focus on Jesus' atoning death and look at how he died to conquer Satan, to save sinners, and to reveal God's holy nature to this, and then to give new life to us as his re redeemed, new redeemed humanity. Now, all the four Gospels show us, as they do in relation to who Jesus is, they show us the uniqueness of his mission. And from the opening verse of Matthew to the closing verse of John, we have the spirit-inspired, spirit-directed record of the Son's mission. So if we want to know the Son, we must soak ourselves in the four Gospels. We must read them and reread them and study them and meditate on them and allow God's Holy Spirit to reveal God's personal word to us through his written word. Now the four Gospels, they're not identical, they're complementary, and they give complementary perspectives on the Son's unique mission. So, for example, Matthew emphasizes the truth that Jesus came to establish God's kingdom and to conquer the evil powers of darkness. It underlines the Son's mission, and it involves defeating Satan. That's the keynote. Mark stresses the truth that Jesus came to be the suffering servant, to bear the wrath of God against sin, and to reconcile us to God. It underlines that the mission involves saving sinners. Luke seems to take pains to show that Jesus came to be the pattern for every man and woman in his daily death to self and his desires to the flesh. He came to show humanity how to live and die. It underlines the Son's mission involving living the perfect human life. And then John shows that Jesus came to demonstrate to the world what God is like and to reveal the Father and repro reproduce the Father's nature to be the perfect revelation of the living God. And John's gospel underlines that Jesus' mission involves God's, the giving of God's own Son and the Son's giving of his own life to humanity. Well, of course, when we look uh, more closely at the gospels, we see that every, every facet of Jesus' mission 
is uh, just a different aspect which is reflected there in those Gospels. We're going to look at this mission of the Son throughout his life, but uh, later on we're going to look at his death, but right now we're going to focus on his mission in life. And uh, we begin with the baptism of Jesus, Jesus' baptism. And so the mission of Jesus really begins at his baptism. Uh, that's when he starts his public ministry. And when we look at the baptismal accounts, we can see them from lots of different viewpoints. We can see, for example, that in the Jordan, the Son came to obey the Father and to submit to his will. And then after submitting and obeying, he went forth in authority to rule over Satan. We can also see, too, that in the River Jordan, Jesus came to take a lowly position and to accept his ministry, uh, or the ministry from his human cousin, John the Baptist. And then the son goes away into the wilderness to be looked after by angels, to be with wild animals, and to prepare for sacrificial service. Then again, we can look at the baptism of Jesus from another perspective of how the son left behind his family, his friends, his job, his security, his possessions, and put himself unconditionally at the disposal of the Father. And then after the anointing of the Spirit, he follows the Spirit into the desert, ready to lead men and women and to call them to follow him. And then also we can see uh, in the baptism of Jesus the revelation of the Lamb of God to sh who came to show people what God was really like. And as the Lamb, he went down to symbolize death and he came up from the water to offering new resurrection life to us all. However we think about the, the uh, mission of Jesus, we must think about the mission with these complementary perspectives. All of these perspectives are true. If we overlook one and neglect it and emphasize, overemphasize another, we will be unbalanced and we won't be giving people the fullness of the Bible's revelation here. Of course, you can't on every occasion stress everything about the mission of the Son, but we must have a balanced understanding. He's not just the king, he's the servant. He's not just the Son of God, he's also the man, Christ Jesus. I also notice in the baptism of Jesus something that we can call prophetic phases. They're prophetic because they apply way outside of the context of Jesus' own baptism. First of all, he goes down into the water, then he rises up from the water, then he stands praying, and then the heavens open and the Spirit comes to him. This is a prophetic sequence. Death, it goes down to the water. Resurrection, it comes out of the water. Prayer, and then the anointing with the Spirit. These themes run throughout the life of Jesus' mission on earth because we say that every day the Son, as it were, died to self. He always lived the risen, victorious life. He always prepared for everything in prayer, and he was always reassured, directed, and empowered by the Holy Spirit in every aspect of his ministry. And so this sequence of prophetic phases was perfectly fulfilled by Jesus through his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, by his prayers for his disciples, and then for the Spirit to come and the way in which he poured out the Spirit at Pentecost to equip us for mission. And so, it's easy, again, maybe to focus on one or two of these phases, rather than understanding that Jesus' mission incorporated them all. It's right, of course, to stress the importance of prayer, for example. But it's not right to suggest that prayer is everything. You have to go from the place of prayer, under the power of the Holy Spirit, and deal with the devil. Jesus did prepare for everything in prayer, but he did not only pray to the Father, he also got on with doing what the Father had given him to do. So it's not just staying at home and praying, it's also going out in the mission field. It's not just prayer, it's also evangelism. So equally, it's important to realize that Jesus depended on the Spirit's anointing, but it's not correct to give the impression that nothing else matters. You see, Jesus had to die to self. As well as praying to the Father, and receiving the anointing. And so, it's not enough for us to say we need to be anointed in our mission. We also need to live the Christ life and carry our own cross. And so, these prophetic phases of the Son's baptism 
are all biblical emphases. They're all rooted in the Son's mission, and they are all important for us in our mission and our life today. Now, when we think about each of these prophetic phases, we can say, for example, that his descent into the water represents judgment and repentance. Because the judgment on sin is death. It represents bearing the sins of the world, dedicating everything to God, like a grain of wheat going into the ground to die in order to re reproduce itself. And then the... Uh, important other phase of Jesus coming out of the water, it represents his, his resurrection authority. It represents his cleanliness, his purity of life. It represents his public ministry because he presented himself out of the waters of baptism for his public ministry. It represents the new shoot which will reproduce itself many, many times over. We could also say that when Jesus stood praying, he was praying for the Holy Spirit to come, but also, he was praying, maybe, that his mind and body and spirit might be entirely under God's authority. It was a prayer of consecration. He was praying, maybe, that his sacrifice would be effective in his followers' lives, that they too would follow him. He was standing where they should stand. It's right that we should fulfill all righteousness, he said to John. And, and as a result of that, he knew that he was representing us and, and therefore he wanted us to follow him and maybe he was praying, maybe he was saying, Lord, as I stand in, the, in these waters, it's not exactly clear where he prayed, whether he was at, exactly right up out of the water or if he started to walk a little bit out of the water by the bank, but wherever he was, Lord, others are going to follow me here. Father, others are going to come and be baptized. I pray for them right now. I, we don't know what he was praying, but I'm showing you how that all that we do know about the prayer life of Jesus and his mission and his ministry is represented here prophetically in this act of baptism. Maybe also he was praying that he would live his life faultlessly and accomplish everything that God had purposed for him. Father, I'm just going now. I'm going to enter into my public ministry. I'm going to move forward in your purpose and your mission for my life. I, I just lay hold of that and I ask you to help me. I want to do it. I want to please you in everything. And maybe he was asking the Father that God might be glorified in his life and ministry and that he would be fruitful and successful in all of it. Then we can also understand that the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus was an empowerment and an authority for his confrontation with evil spirits and disease. It was an equipping for the Son's dove-like sacrifice and service. It was also a gift of vital assurance because the Spirit assures us that we are sons of God, and it must have had an assuring effect upon Jesus. It was a reconfirmation. Yes, I am your son. It would have also been the indispensable resource of Jesus that he should, by the Spirit, radiate God's love and God's glory. Now, it should be clear again that all of these emphases in themselves are equally true, but none of these is the whole truth on its own. And one of the ways in which Satan causes more confusion and division within the church is to tempt believers and churches and maybe even whole streams and denominations to overemphasize one particular truth or to overlook another. And then uh, this often happens rather than by complete rejection and, and, and getting people to... Uh, adopt outright error and falsehood. It's very difficult for one person or one congregation to know and fully proclaim the full truth and the full nature and mission of Jesus. That's why there are four Gospels and not one Gospel. But in each Gospel, they, they, as these Gospels uh, stand with the other Gospels, so we should ensure that our emphasis stands alongside the other emphases that there are in the body of Christ and not to overemphasize one as against the other. For Jesus' mission is a multifaceted mission. And the, so the truth about this baptism of Jesus as a starting point for his mission, it symbolized that it was to be a multifaceted and various ministry. And uh, 
when we take an overview of each of the different gospel strands and emphases, we can say that the Father sent the Son to earth, that the Son willingly came with a mission to break the power of evil. Satan had taken authority on the earth and the whole world was under his sway. So the Son came into the world to establish the kingdom of heaven, to disarm the evil powers of darkness and to triumph decisively over them. He came to preach a message of repentance, to teach people the consequences of disobedience and to give them clear guidelines of living in the kingdom of God. Well, you know what gospel I'm describing there. Matthew's Gospel. But we can also say that the Father sent the Son with a mission to seek and to save the lost. He came to save needy people who were powerless to save themselves. At great personal sacrifice, the Son of God, the suffering servant of the Lord, came to make atonement for sin, to be the substitute for each member of humanity, to bear the just wrath of God against sin. That's Mark's Gospel. We can also say that the Father sent the Son, and He willingly came, to demonstrate a human life of perfect consecration and holiness. He came to be the perfect pattern and example for all men and women of all ages, of all races, and every culture and generation. In the way in which He lived and died, He came to show us how we are meant to live and die. That's Luke's Gospel. We can also say that the Father sent the Son to show the world what God is like. So as the Son's mission to reveal the glorious Father in all His majesty, to be God's living Word, to be the unique and complete public revelation of the invisible God. That's John's Gospel. So in each of the Gospels we have a, a unique description of what the Son's mission is. And when we put these four Gospels together, we have a beautiful, composite picture of the mission of the Son. But perhaps one of the most clearest statements concerning the Son's mission is what we may call His manifesto. It's found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. And it's this address in which Jesus addresses the, the synagogue in Nazareth, where he describes his mission. You know the situation. He's given the book of Isaiah to read. He reads from the book of Isaiah these verses, and then he comments on it very succinctly and says, this day is this scripture being fulfilled in your hearing. Luke 4, verses 18 to 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, I read it in an animated fashion because that's how I believe he read it. I don't believe he read it like this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I don't think he was reading it like some kind of synagogue ritual. He was announcing it. He was, I, I was going to say something which wasn't quite right. He, he, was, he was cheating, which of course he, he, he never cheats. But the point, the point is this, he, they gave him to read the scripture and he thought, I know. I'm going to turn this into a sermon. So he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has appointed me to preach the gospel. That's why, they were, they were, that's why they were angry. It's the way he read it. He's saying, and then he said, yes, you're right. This scripture is fulfilled in me today. You've heard it and you're seeing it. That was his mission statement. So Jesus explains that the purpose of his anointing, first of all, was that he should preach and spread good news to the poor, to the hurting. Now we've seen this in Reaching the lost, potokos, the word for poor, is not so much talking about only those who have no money. It's talking about those who are hurting, who are bruised, who are broken, who need healing, who need salvation. Then he goes on to describe five examples of what evangelizing the poor means. What evangelizing the hurting means in practice. 
And here we have probably the clearest definition of his mission. He is, in his unique mission, the one called to heal the brokenhearted, to liberate the captives, restore sight to the blind, release the oppressed, and proclaim God's message of freedom and favor. So the Son was not sent from the Father and anointed with the Spirit just with a mission of preaching. He came to reveal God through words and deeds and, and through his perfect life. So the potokos, the poor, means the afflicted, the hurting. And again, we find this multifaceted mission in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 18 to 22. John the Baptist is now in prison doubting whether Jesus really is the Christ because he didn't, I suppose, seem to fulfill John's preconceptions of what Messiah should do. I'm in prison and he's out there having fun. This is ridiculous. Are you really the Messiah? What am I doing in prison if you're the Messiah? You're supposed to set us free. And so Jesus sends this message back to John. Verse 21. At that very hour, he cured many infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and gave many blind their sight. Verse 22 goes on to record what he says to John. He says, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Well, so in other words, I've come to do this. This is the mission of Messiah. And if I'm doing these things, then I am he. So it's not just preaching. It's also healing the sick, opening the eyes of the blind, cleansing the leper. Have you ever seen a leper cleansed? I have. It's one of the most wonderful things to see, a leper cleansed. I've not yet personally seen the dead raised, but I've spoken to people who have. Oh, these things happen because his mission is still being carried on in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that brings to an end today's teaching on knowing the Son. And I pray that throughout these programs, God will give you greater and greater revelation concerning Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We'll be back next time with more teaching on knowing the Son. 